What's happening everyone? Chris with Cowdog here. and Today we're going to be making a sliding timber frame barn door with traditional Japanese joinery. Stick around and check it out. I think it goes without saying that every project begins with sizing and breaking down lumber. This is going to be built in frame and panel style, reminiscent of a cabinet door. So I'm using 8 quarter ash for the frame portion and later we'll be working with 4 quarter ash for the panel. Now this board still had a bit of a bend in it despite being jointed, so I'm going to use my number 8 to joint it by hand and get that hip out of the middle section. These boards are over 6 feet long, so I can't cross cut them to final length on my table saw, so the track saw is a great alternative. I should have gang cut them side by side, but for some reason thought it was a good idea to stack them instead. So to line up my track, I use the blade of my square in the kerf, and then push the splinter guard to the blade to duplicate the cut. A spritz of denatured alcohol softens the end grain to make it easier to flush up with the low angle jack plane. To join the upper rail to the vertical styles, I've designed a modified version of Ariwa Kone Hozosashi, a collared haunch mortise and tenon joint. The traditional joint is found in the book The Complete Japanese Joinery, which I've linked along with a number of tools and products used in this video below. Since I'm still quite a rookie to Japanese carpentry, I take a little extra time with the layout and use a pencil first to mark my lines before going over in 0.1mm pen. Don't worry about the pen lines in your finished product, as these will be planed off when finished. In another departure from tradition, I also use western saws primarily, and that's just a manner of comfort as opposed to function. The basics when cutting these joints by hand is just to take small bites and relief cuts from both sides, staying close yet away from your marking lines, and then paring everything down with a chisel to final dimension. And in case you missed my video on building this Nicholson workbench, I'll have it linked in the corner above. Being able to securely support longboards on edge for sawing like this was one of the reasons why I chose the Nicholson with the dog hold aprons. And of course, to address the thousand pound elephant in the room, Yes, most of this can be done on a bandsaw, but honestly, where's the fun in that? And as far as pairing, I still have a terrible habit of taking off a little bit more than I can chew. You really should only be taking paper thin shavings at a time to get to your final line, and that's just more of a long term goal for me in this practice. Also, while I'm not consistent with this practice during this build, you want to pair end grain before slicing down your edge grain to ensure a cleaner result. And in yet another breakaway from Japanese tradition, I'm using a marking gauge to mark some lines first before tracing over them in pen. The Japanese do use marking gauges, but typically for breaking down boards and large panels and not for the purpose of joinery. And as an aside, if you're not waxing your saw plate, you're really blowing it. This golf wax is just a few dollars for what feels like a lifetime supply, and it's great for saw plates and plane bottoms to help reduce friction and increase glide. If you're curious about general proportions here, the tenon's thickness is just one third of the overall thickness of the board.
A router plane is a nice accessory here because it'll ensure that my tenon is directly parallel to my outside surfaces. I don't have a rabbiting block plane which will get me all the way to the edge, so this will get me that trued surface before I use a low angle plane across the grain to get to final dimension. If you've got a keen eye, you've probably seen two spray bottles on my workbench for the most part. One bottle is denatured alcohol, which I previously explained is for helping soften wood grain, but the other bottle is just tap water. The water is sprayed onto the bottom of these right angle jigs to prevent them from sliding around while clamped to the workpiece. As a more disgusting aside, I don't change the water too often and here in South Florida where it's nice and humid, it'll start growing stuff in it and getting green, so you should probably dump the water after every session. And for my next trick, I'm going to cut the tenons for a modified version of Jaguchi Hozosashi, a rabbit and half-blind mortise and tenon joint. Once again, the original version of this can be found in the complete Japanese joinery. This joint is designed to join the lower rail to the vertical styles. Initially, when I started cutting this joint, I had the idea of doing a through tenon instead of a blind, but after picturing the amount of work required to hog out that waste for the mortise, I decided against it. And as an extra security measure, I wrote some love notes to myself on blue tape to make sure I wasn't cutting off vital parts of the tenon. Prior to getting into Japanese joinery, I never really spent a lot of time using a chisel to chunk out waste. Here I'm going bevel up, but as I later learned when blasting through large chunks of waste, going bevel down actually makes for quicker work. And once again, the router plane proved to be vital. I have to say I do struggle a lot to sharpen the iron on this sucker. This is a turn of the century plane and the iron is equally as old. Eventually I'm planning on getting some Veritas router plane irons for it, which are compatible with these vintage Stanleys. If you're not working with right angle jigs for your joinery, you are really missing out. This was something that I only got into when I started with Japanese carpentry, but even for Western woodworking, 90 degree jigs are essential. I can't think of many things that make my life easier and my work more accurate. For each project, I have a couple and a different sizes and lengths to tackle the unique situations that I'm encountering. This slicing technique is extremely helpful too. It's a bit difficult to see in the shop, but I'm actually anchoring the butt of the chisel into my chest, almost like those outlawed chest putters in golf, and then using the corner to slice, in this case with the grain. Also, with any components that have access from both sides, pair from both sides to ensure the component is even and square. Just like middle school math class, it's a requirement to go back and check your work. Since there's a lot of topography on these joints, you want to make sure that all your components in every dimension are square. It's worth mentioning here that unlike in most western woodworking, Japanese carpentry is done in a tenon first method. I'd previously always done mortises first because I've learned that it's easier to trim a tenon to fit a mortise than to trim a mortise to fit a tenon. Now expertly trained Japanese carpenters for the most part operate by splitting a 0.1 millimeter line. There's a saying, the line is life. I however still kind of suck so when I work on a mortise component I check the tenon and depending on my marking and tenon size make a decision to either leave, half, or take the line. Again, getting to a point where I consistently split the line is my end goal. And yes, I'm using a domino to hog out the bulk of my mortises. This can be done with a drill press if you have a lot of wing support. You can also do it with a drill and chisels. I own a domino, so in my mind, this is just a really expensive slot cutting drill for this purpose. 
Also, it was pretty convenient in that the domino runs off metric measurements and I mapped out my joints using the metric system. And since the domino that I have only goes so deep, the rest is drilled and chiseled out. I only own a couple mortise chisels, but this project definitely got me jonesing to have some larger ones, perhaps a half inch mortise chisel. If you don't know the difference between a mortise and bench chisel, mortising chisels have squared sides, which makes the shape a lot more stout to resist the adverse effects of heavy pounding. Bringing the joint together proved to be a lot more challenging than anticipated. The fit is extremely tight, so tight in fact that I had to use pipe clamps to bring it all together since pounding away at it wasn't effective at all. After speaking to my buddy Dylan Iwakuni, he mentioned that a lot of times they'll actually wax the tenons to help bring them together and use clamps similarly to how I did or ratchet straps to draw very tight joints together. And as you can see, with no adhesives, pure friction fit, this joint is solid. Now after fitting that last joint, it dawned on me that I'm not going to be able to fit these joints and pull them apart the way I would with previous projects. Initially the idea was that I wanted to dado the panel into the frame. However, I decided that since this barn door was for a pantry, it would really have only one show side, that I would go ahead and rabbit the panel in, which turns this door into what is essentially a giant picture frame. More on that later. The rabbited tenon needs a dado to nest into. If you have a domino, you may notice these spring flaps. I believe they're to help with alignment, but they can sometimes get in the way and cause the domino to misalign when working close to the edge. If you tighten these set screws, you can lock them away and ensure that your reference face is 90 degrees. Now attaching the opposing style was a bit scary since it means that both opposing joints need to be perfectly aligned with their respective tenons. This is where marking becomes vital to your process because if you're not aligned there's not really too much margin for error here when bringing this style on. After it came together I trimmed the excess tenons to final length using a guide block which I clamped to the frame. The final product of this door is extremely heavy and once this frame came together that 8 quarter ash really started to feel like 8 quarter ash. I'm going to take a wild stab and say that the final product is comfortably over 100 pounds. If you're familiar with my work you might know that I love hybridizing woodworking styles and this project is no different. I wanted to put some green and green influence into this door so I'm doing some angular cutouts on all sides. The top and bottom are pretty self-explanatory but the cutouts on the sides meet in an apex in the middle which will obviate the need for this pantry door to have a handle. Now mapping these out took a few tries with pencil to get something aesthetically pleasing but eventually I found a shape that I liked. Thank you. 
The width of the door maxed out my workbench, which is only 27 inches wide, so I used my holdfast and some scraps to give me some wings to support the frame while I worked. This required some gymnastics too to be able to work on this door effectively in such a small space. As mentioned before, I'm going to rabbit the panel in, so I'm busting out the router and routing from the back side of the frame. I went ahead and did two passes to get to my final depth. The corners end up with a radius because of the guide bearing on the router bit, so I'm just gonna hack that out with a chisel. If we're talking wish list items, a corner chisel would also be nice too. To get those cutouts started, I'm plunge cutting with the track saw on a small track. A jigsaw may have worked here too, but I wasn't confident I could get as straight an edge as I wanted. However, using the track saw does leave a little apex of material since it is a circular saw blade, and I used my hand saw in some extremely awkward positions to finish the cut. And after 10 shirts and however many hours working on this thing, I'm starting to lose my grip to say the least. Back to the wish list, a chisel plane would be great here to get right into those tight corners, however the card scraper was a worthy alternative. The rabbit at the bottom of the frame needs to accommodate for the cutout, so I'm going to rerun the rabbiting bit at the same depth and then cut out the excess. And as you might be able to tell, this is where I learned about using my chisel bevel down to speed up the hugging out of waste. At this point in the video, I don't think it's any secret, but the cornerstone of each of these processes is to saw, chisel, and then refine. Most of the time, refining is a combo of finished chiseling and using the router plane or some other plane to produce a final surface. And this here is the step where all the marking lines come off. Here's a nice awkward position. I just needed to flush the end grain up to the top rail, but finding a comfortable place to run my low angle jack was challenging to say the least with such a small space and such a large frame. This small dado is to accommodate a guide tab for the barn door that'll keep it plumb with the overhead track. Once again, in the spirit of green and green furniture, the exterior edges of the frame will be hit with a roundover. The interior edge of the frame, however, will be done with an eighth inch chamfer, and to eliminate the rounded corners, I'll hit that with a chisel. The decor in my pantry and bar area is black and white, so I wanted to lighten up the wood as much as possible and bleach my ash, holes and all. This is my first time using wood bleach and this formula is a one-to-one -one mix, which makes things nice and simple. I applied it using a regular sponge and just sop it on and wipe the excess off. The wood bleach does pop the grain a bit, so running a scraper or light sandpaper after the fact is necessary. You'll start seeing some instant results and removal of some of the red, pink, and brown tones but the bleach isn't fully neutralized for 36 hours, which is when maximum results are achieved. For the panel, I'm using four quarter ash and ripping everything down to pre-glue up dimensions.
and of course I forgot that I needed one extra board so I'm trimming that one up before breaking out Mike Farrington's double tapered sanding disc to clean up all the edges. Mike's sanding disc attaches to my table saw in lieu of a blade and creates a glue ready edge that's great for panel glue ups. I'll link Mike's video up in the corner which should also have links to his website if you're interested in the disc. I will say that while it's a great tool, it's definitely a bit tricky for a first timer, so get some practice reps in on some scrap before you attempt larger operations. I'm not just feeling up my wood here, but rather feeling the surface to map out grain direction. Since the construction of my workbench, I've become more cognizant of trying to run grain direction as best as I can in one direction to make finish planing easier. If the wood feels coarse one way and smooth in the other, the smooth direction is the direction that the grain is running. This is a bit of a departure from that smiley face, frowny face, end grain theory that's been popular over the years for panel glue ups, but I think the aesthetically pleasing flow of the final product and the ease in finishing speaks for itself. These panel boards are brought together with the domino. Again, if you're familiar with some of my other work, when I'm gluing up panels, I use the wide mortise setting on one side and the tight mortise setting on the other to allow for some lateral adjustment and faster assembly during the glue up. It's rather cliche, but in a panel, the strength is from the glued edge, not necessarily the floating tenons. So the domino is mostly for alignment in this instance, as opposed to strength. If it's not obvious from looking, I'm doing this glue up in two separate sections, each consisting of three boards. I've started drifting away from larger glue ups done all at once because it's so hot here in South Florida that the glue begins setting up a lot quicker than I'd care for. Taking smaller bites at the finished product allows for me to have a stress-free glue up and a better quality glue up in general. After the two panels are glued up, I'll fold it down like a book, clamp it together, and run the number eight joiner plane on the edge. While I'm aiming for square here, if I'm off a touch, it's not the end of the world, as when reassembling the sides together, the imperfections will correspond and create a seamless glue up. If you're having trouble picturing this in your head, think of the boards when sitting next to each other as two backslashes in a URL. When sitting beside each other, they are congruent, but when unfolded out, they are askew. After that, both halves are joined together once again with the domino four alignment. After the glue is dried, I'll rip a straight line with the track saw down one edge and then very carefully run the whole panel through the table saw to zip the remaining edge off. And then the ends are trimmed to final dimension. And then the whole panel is subsequently planed. Ash is known for having some pretty wacky and wild grain with some really intense direction changes, so when I'm using the low angle jack, I've got the 55 degree iron in to plow through those trouble spots and minimize tear out. What little tear out I do get, gets taken care of by the card scraper. Before getting into some more router work, I'll clean up the edges again with the joiner plane. I'll be rabbiting the panel from the front or show side of the panel, that way the panel will actually sit into the frame further, setting the panel a bit more towards the front of the frame. And the bottom rail detail on the panel is subsequently cut to match the frame. Wood bleach is then added to the panel as well.
To go further green and green, I'm going to put some ebony plugs in the corners. This is not just aesthetically pleasing, but these plugs are actually long enough to gently pin the tenons in the corners of the frame in place. This little gadget is something I got from Lee Valley Tools, and it's a 5 16th of an inch square hole punch for drilling square holes. It's a nice alternative to a hollow chisel mortiser, and a hell of a lot cheaper. You just punch it in, drill, punch a little deeper, drill, rinse and repeat, and then clean out the bottom with a chisel. The exposed end of the plug is pillowed, as they say, using a piece of 220 grit on a flat surface. In this case, my table saw surface. Then it gets just a touch of 2 to 1 epoxy before sticking this ebony plug right in my bleached ash hole. A little acetone to clean it up. The finish is surprisingly uncomplicated. I'm using Real Milk Paint Company's soft white wax followed by their clear carnauba wax. The white wax will act as a pore filler to whiten the overall look, pop the grin, and give a silky smooth underlayment. This is done in a wipe-on, wipe-off application with a rag. This finish visually is very reminiscent to Rubio Cotton White and gives the wood almost a whitewashed accent that doesn't appear painted like some finishes can. To mount the panel, I'll pre-drill for Z-clips which will pin the panel in place. I'll also mark for center and pre-drill for the barn door hardware. Then the entire frame is waxed like the panel. The Z-clips were part of my pivot when I decided to not data the panel in place, and this application is only good for a door that's going to have one show side. I'll be honest and say that I considered using figure 8 fasteners, but the Z-clips, by happy accident, happened to be at the perfect depth for this particular frame and panel. And after I nearly gave myself a hernia hanging this sucker, it is done. What else is to be said about this creation? The end product really speaks for itself. This was a three month build, give or take, that had 19 shirt changes. There were days I'd spend hours on it and days I'd spend a half hour, 45 minutes. The soul of this build though is in the joinery, taking traditional Japanese joints for home construction and modifying them to create something new. The green and green look just felt aesthetically congruent to this style, and I'm proud to be able to look on this ridiculously overbuilt pantry door and tell its story to those who get to see it. If you've watched this build all the way through, it's my solemn hope that this video will inspire to spark your curiosity in something different, or even better, to send you down a lifelong rabbit hole. As said in the introduction to the complete Japanese joinery, learning begins with the basics in this tradition. Doing. So with that being said, go do something, build something. All right, folks, that's it for me on this one. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for more notifications. Also, I'll have all the tools that I use listed in the description below. Those are Amazon affiliate links. Each purchase really helps my channel. There will also be additional affiliate links for Starbond CA glues, as well as Real Milk Paint Company's finishes. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks. All right guys, if you're a fan of my whiskey reviews, you are in for a treat as I just came back from Kentucky doing a little bit of the bourbon trail and managed to get my hands on some of this Weller Special Reserve from the Buffalo Trace Distillery. This stuff is extremely delicious, spicy, a little bit on the rare side. The front end chew's a little heavy, so it is a bold flavor. It's not gonna get lost in any kind of mixes. This is one of the Norland glasses, which is a nice glass for drinking whiskey neat. The glass itself is double walled, so you don't have to worry about your hands actually warming your whiskey glass. Now, when tasting whiskey, it's important to get a nice good nose in there. Really get all those notes, all those flavors. You really smell the caramel in this one. Delicious, honestly, amazing. If you can find it, get yourself a bottle of this Weller Reserve. It's well worth it. it runs approximately $40 a bottle. I've heard some places you can find it a lot cheaper, especially in Canada. Shout out Mortgage and Miter. Have a good one, guys. See you on the next one.